Welcome to our video about proximal convoluted tubule. Today we're going to discuss the physiology and the pathology that can affect the proximal convoluted tubules. So let's get started. The proximal convoluted tubule lies between the Bowman's capsule and the lopophily. The major function is the reabsorption of a lot of important nutrients, including sodium, potassium, glucose, bicarbonate, urea, and amino acids. The major driving force for the reabsorption of all these nutrients is the sodium reabsorption. So important point is maintaining low intracellular sodium is the key for the reabsorption of all these nutrients. And this is the important point that we need to keep in mind when we talk about the function of the proximal convoluted tubule. Maintaining low intracellular sodium is the key. The cells that line the wall of the proximal convoluted tubules are called brush border cells. And this is because they look like our toothbrush. These are simple cuboidal cells with the presence of microvilli on their apical surface. These microvilli make sure there is increased surface area for the reabsorption because these cells reabsorb a lot of the nutrients. Also, the presence of these microvilli helps to differentiate the cells of the proximal convoluted tubules from the rest of the nephron. For example, the cells of the distal convoluted tubules are also cuboidal cells, but they lack this brush border or they lack these microvilli. These cells are heavily packed with mitochondria, and this is because this reabsorption requires a lot of active transport, and this active transport requires a lot of energy. So we need a lot of mitochondria for this reabsorptive function. Also keep in mind that cuboidal cells are bigger in size than squamous cells. These cuboidal cells are bigger in size because they contain a lot of mitochondria and a lot of organelles for the active transport. And that's why you're going to see that these squamous cells does not really perform a lot of active transport. Most of the transport across these squamous cells is just simple transport compared to the transport across these cuboidal cells, which most of the time has active transport. There are two types of transport on these cells. One is called transcellular, which means just across the cell. And the second is called paracellular, which means in between two cells. Brush border cells has two surfaces. The first is called apical surface, which faces the tubular lumen, and a basolateral surface, which faces the interstitium. Now let's talk about the function of the proximal convoluted tubules. The first function is sodium and bicarbonate reabsorption. Let's imagine this is the tubular lumen, this is the interstitium, and this is the peritubular capillary lumen. This is the apical surface of these cells, and this is the basolateral surface of these cells. The first step lies here. So in the tubular lumen, hydrogen ions and bicarbonate combine to form carbonic acid. The second step, carbonic anhydrase will convert this carbonic acid into water and carbon dioxide. And as we know, water and carbon dioxide can easily diffuse through passive diffusion into the inside of these brush border cells, where it becomes converted again into carbonic acid. In the third step, the carbonic anhydrase inside the brush border cells will reconvert the carbonic acid into hydrogen ions and bicarbonate. In the fourth step, the hydrogen ions will move back or will become secreted back into the tubular lumen in exchange with sodium that will move into the inside of the cell. This transporter is called sodium hydrogen anti-porter. Since the two ions are moving in two opposite directions, we call it anti-porter. This is in contrast to the fifth step where sodium and bicarbonate becomes reabsorbed by the basolateral surface into the interstitium and then into the blood. This transporter is called sodium bicarbonate co-transporter or SEM porter. So again, if the two ions are moving in two opposite directions, we call this anti-porter. If they're moving in two similar directions or in the same direction, we call this SEM porter. In order for all these steps to keep happening, we need to maintain low intracellular sodium. So the sixth step lies here. 
through the sodium potassium ATPase pump, which will pump sodium out of the cell in exchange of potassium that will move inside of the cell. These two ions are moving against their concentration gradients. So this step requires ATP. Finally, two additional points. The bicarbonate can move into the interstitium in exchange for chloride to maintain the electrical neutrality. And then the sodium and chloride through the sodium chloride sim porter can move into the brush border cells and then the chloride can move back into the interstitium. So bottom line of all these steps is maintaining low intracellular sodium is the key for the reabsorption of bicarbonate. Also dysfunction or inhibition of function of the carbonic anhydrase enzymes will result in diuresis because of the loss of the sodium and metabolic acidosis because of the loss of bicarbonate. An example of this will be the renal tubular acidosis type 2, sometimes called proximal renal tubular acidosis, and also some medications like acetazolamide, which is a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor. The second function is the glucose and amino acid reabsorption. So again, this is the tubular lumen, this is the interstitium, this is the peritubular capillaries, this is the apical surface, and this is the basolateral surface. Sodium and glucose moves into the inside of the brush border cells through the sodium glucose sim porter. And then the glucose becomes reabsorbed into the interstitium and into the blood through glucose transporter 1 and glucose transporter 2. Amino acid reabsorption happens in the same exact way like glucose. So through sodium, amino acid, co-transporter or symporter, the sodium and amino acid will move into the inside of the brush border cells. And then the amino acids through transporters will move back into the blood. In order to maintain this function, we need to maintain low intracellular sodium again. And this is again the function of the sodium potassium ATPase that requires ATP to pump sodium outside of the cell and potassium inside of the cell. Also, inorganic phosphate becomes reabsorbed in the same way as glucose and amino acids. Finally, sodium, potassium, and chloride move along their concentration gradient back into the blood through this paracellular transport between two brush border cells. The third function is the reabsorption of water, potassium, and urea. Water moves from areas of low osmolarity to high osmolarity through the process of osmosis. It uses aquaporin channels on the apical surface of the brush border cells to move into the interstitium. Urea moves along its concentration gradient from the tubular lumen into the interstitium, and it uses the same aquaporin channels. The mechanism by which potassium is reabsorbed from the tubular lumen into the inside of the brush border cells is not really well understood. But after it becomes inside the brush border cells, it becomes reabsorbed into the interstitium along its concentration gradient. Finally, water, urea, and potassium can also move through the paracellular route along their concentration gradient into the interstitium. The fourth function is the generation of ammonium as a urinary buffer. This whole thing starts with glutamine that through a series of enzymatic reactions becomes converted into bicarbonate and ammonium. Ammonium can get into the tubular lumen through either one of two mechanisms. The first, it can go directly with exchange of sodium through sodium-ammonium antiporter. The second way is the ammonium becomes converted into hydrogen ions and ammonia and both of them become secreted into the tubular lumen. Inside the tubular lumen, 
the ammonium becomes generated again and it combines with chloride and forms ammonium chloride. The major function of this is to allow the excess excretion of acid, which is this hydrogen ion, without changing the urinary pH. Without this mechanism, the urine pH becomes too acidic and that can be dangerous to the urinary system. The fifth function is the secretion or excretion of many medications into the lumen of the proximal convoluted tubules. And this is done through a transporter called organic anion transporter that's located in the basolateral surface of these cells. Examples of medications that get secreted include loop diuretics, thiazide diuretics, acetazolamide, amyloride, paraaminohyporic acid, which is a substance that's used to estimate the renal blood flow, uric acid, endomethacin, methotrexate, penicillin, morphine, tetracycline, neostigmine, and many more. The process starts at the basolateral surface with organic anion transporter moving one molecule of these medications, let's say paraaminohyporic acid, into the inside of these brush border cells in exchange of another substance called dicarboxylic acid. In order to move dicarboxylic acid back into these cells, we use a co-transporter with sodium. Then these medications moves into the lumen in exchange of a chloride to maintain electrical neutrality. Remember, these are anions. Since all these medications or organic anions use the same organic anion transporter for their secretion into the tubular lumen, they can compete with each other and they can decrease the rate of secretion of each other. So this will lead to the buildup of these substances in the blood and their toxicity. Sixty-five percent of sodium, potassium, chloride, and water are reabsorbed by the proximal convoluted tubules. All the filtered glucose should be reabsorbed as long as the blood level is below 160 mg per deciliter. Above this level, the glucose will start to appear in the urine in something called glucosuria. And this is pathological. Also, all the filtered amino acids should be reabsorbed. And if there is any amino acids in urine is also pathological, 50% of the area should be reabsorbed, 80% of the phosphate is reabsorbed, parathyroid hormone reduces the reabsorption of phosphate by the proximal convoluted tubule cells by inhibiting the sodium phosphate co-transporter. And in this way, the parathyroid hormone controls the amount of the reabsorbed phosphate. Finally, 90% of the bicarbonate is reabsorbed. There are two hormones that act on the proximal convoluted tubules. The first is angiotensin II, and this increases the sodium and bicarbonate reabsorption, and the parathyroid hormone that decreases the phosphate reabsorption, and this is by inhibiting the sodium phosphate co-transporter. Finally, let's discuss this very high yield chart that represents the reabsorption of different solutes along the tubular lumen. So the horizontal line here represents the distance along the proximal tubule, and the vertical line represents the osmolarity of the tubular fluid compared to the plasma. At one, the osmolarity of the tubular fluid equals the osmolarity of the plasma. So if the ratio of the solute is more than one, that could mean one of two things. Either the solute reabsorption is slower than the water reabsorption, so the solute becomes more concentrated, or the solute is actively secreted into the tubular lumen. This part of the chart represents only the reabsorption. So if the solute is also secreted, that will be more than the inulin. So the inulin here represents the cutoff limit. The inulin is a substance that's neither reabsorbed nor secreted. So the amount of inulin in the tubular lumen does not change. If the ratio is less than one, that means the substance reabsorption is quicker than the water reabsorption. Since sodium reabsorption is the main driving force for water reabsorption, sodium ratio will be the closest to water. This is followed by potassium and chloride. 50% of the urea is reabsorbed, so it goes next. And then inulin, as we said, is a substance that's neither reabsorbed nor secreted, so it remains here. So any substance above the level of inulin 
not only it does not undergo any kind of reabsorption, but it also undergoes some kind of secretion. Creatinine undergoes just a little bit of secretion, plus it's freely filtered. And that's why creatinine is very close to inulin, and that's why creatinine as well as inulin are useful in determining the glomerular filtration rate. Paraaminohypuric acid is a substance that becomes freely filtered into the glomerulus. But the remaining paraaminohypuric acid that reaches the kidney undergoes also active secretion. So all the amount of paraaminohypuric acid that reaches the kidney either becomes freely filtered by the glomerulus without reabsorption or it undergoes active secretion. And that's why paraaminohypuric acid is useful in the termination of the renal blood flow. On the other part or on the other side of the chart, we see here that glucose and amino acid undergoes 100% rate of reabsorption. So by the end of the proximal tubule, no more glucose or amino acid is present. This is followed by bicarbonate, which has a rate of 90% absorption. Finally, the, the phosphate or the inorganic phosphate undergoes about 80% reabsorption, which is under the control of the parathyroid hormone. This is the end of this video. In the next video, we're going to talk about the pathology that can affect the proximal convoluted tubule. Thank you for watching. Please don't forget to subscribe and see you next time.